So this is my first time doing a lecture, so I'm really excited. This is also very different. I'm going to be reading a lot, but hopefully the, the images are engaging and we can have um, a productive conversation later. Um, first, I want to thank Sarah Grace, Erica, um, Alade, who's on uh, with us virtually for having me and for everyone here and also for everyone online. Thank you. Um, there's a lot I hope to cover during this talk, so bear with me as I attempt to take us through different intersecting histories that I feel we need to understand and honor in order to best explore Malcolm X's legacy through a particular social justice framework. Before I get deep into this history of Malcolm X and why I believe we need to be thinking about his work in preservation and beyond, I wanna offer some thoughts around my own personal relationship to Columbia University and a very abridged um, history of Washington Heights. I think this historical grounding is key in really understanding the legacy of structural racism in the built environment and this more current context of Columbia-led gentrification across Upper Manhattan. I was raised in Harlem off of Lenox Avenue, and about a decade away, I moved back to Harlem um, to build and work with the Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz Memorial and Educational Center, and also because Harlem is my home, and this is where my family and my friends are. So this is our first slide. Um, in many ways, I've always existed near Columbia, but never really in it until now. I understand this paradox of existing near but not within as part of the historically intentional disconnect between the university and the greater Harlem and Washington Heights community. There is a literal and metaphysical wall around the main 116th Street campus that too often com keeps uh, community from accessing the wealth of resources that I would argue Columbia and all large institutions excessively hoard. So though my background isn't in planning, architecture, or preservation, my first orientation to Columbia University was a geographic one in which I understood myself as existing within some spatial relationship to the university, where I was on the outside looking in. It's interesting at this point in my life to now be working so closely with a university that I've always had a particularly fraught relationship with as a Harlemite and as a critic of unchecked expansionism. As you may know, Columbia University is the largest landowner in New York City by the number of addresses it manages, which is some 5,000 units across likely more than 250 properties. I feel the university's expansion into Washington Heights and West Harlem, which includes right across the street from my family's home, in many ways reflects a legacy of colonial imperial expansion that harkens back to Columbia's very own namesake, Christopher Columbus. So while undoubtedly many spaces of brilliance and goodness exist throughout the university, like right here in this class, um, pushing the institution forward, it's imperative that we're grounded in the reality that Columbia, quite like many other universities, is also a real estate enterprise with various tax incentives and nefarious investments that maintain the prestige of this Ivy League project. And here is, I think, an interesting graphic that just shows, like, and it's old, so it's not relevant, you know, it's back, you know, I think it was made in 2016. And so obviously Columbia's expanded and now has more properties, but it just shows you how much more Columbia owns than any other private institution um, in New York City. So I wanted to share that contextual history and personal reflection to ground my current relationship with Columbia University, which has come about through my work with the Shabazz Center. The Shabazz Center, located in Washington Heights, is a memorial, cultural, and educational institution committed to honoring the legacies of Malcolm X and his wife, Dr. Betty Shabazz. We're also a hub and activation space for a wide range of social movement work. The Shabazz Center was established by Dr. Betty Shabazz, who was a brilliant educator, movement leader, and force in her own right. It was Dr. Betty Shabazz who led the fight to keep the physical building that we're housed in, the Autobahn Ballroom, which you all visited, uh, standing as a permanent memorial to Malcolm X and his humanitarian efforts. And that was a picture of the ballroom, and then this is the current outside. Uh, of the, the facade. In the 90s, the city of New York and Columbia had plans to tear down the historic Autobahn ballroom to make way for the growing biotech campus as part of the university's rapacious expansion into Washington Heights. 
But community leaders, including Dr. Shabazz, fought against these efforts and were able to preserve 44% of the original Autobahn ballroom structure, which stretches from 166th to 165th and Broadway. The Autobahn Ballroom was originally commissioned by William Fox, the founder of 20th Century Fox, and was initially intended to house the presentation of vaudeville shows and motion pictures. And the building was designed by theater and cinema architect Thomas Lamb, and it was completed in 1912. The land now known as Washington Heights was first home to indig indigenous Wappinger and Lenape people who first settled the Delaware, Pennsylvania, and tri-state area some 10,000 years ago. At the turn of the 20th century, with the extension of the Broadway and 7th Avenue subway lines up to 191st Street, the Washington Heights area exper experienced a rise in middle-class residential construction in the years leading up to World War I. European immigrants who had first crowded into small tenement apartments throughout the Lower East Side of Manhattan began making their way north to Washington Heights. In the 1930s, nearly a quarter of Manhattan's Jewish population lived north of 155th Street. These immigrants reflected the growing refugee populations of Ashkenazi Jews escaping the horrors of the Holocaust. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the demographics of Washington Heights abruptly changed as Puerto Rican, Cuban, and specifically Dominican immigrants migrated to this northern tip of Manhattan which uncoincidentally coincided with the repressive 30-year Trujillo dictatorship in the Dominican Republic. Of course, this influx in Spanish-speaking Caribbean immigrants marked the beginning of white flight and the policy-driven economic disinvestment of Washington Heights, a community that continues to be informed by this legacy today. With this demographic shift came a reconstitution in the use of the Autobahn Ballroom, which no longer catered to its originally white Protestant and European, Eastern European audience, but now hosted dances and performances by singers like Celia Cruz, and also became a, a site for boxing matches amongst other uses. Starting in 1964, the Autobahn Ballroom became the headquarters of Malcolm X's political organizing work with the Organization of Afro-American Unity after his split with the Nation of Islam. On February 21st, 1965, Malcolm was shot and killed on the second floor of the Autobahn Ballroom while giving a speech. In 1967, after the doors of the Autobahn Ballroom closed following his assassination, the city of New York assumed ownership over the building. For decades, the fate of the Autobahn Ballroom was uncertain amidst Columbia's massive land acquisitions and development plans throughout Upper Manhattan. So hopefully this history helps to situate the current relationship between the Autobahn Ballroom, now home to the Shabazz Center and Columbia University. Now I wanna bring us through Malcolm X's evolution into a global humanitarian and anti-imperial leader because his embodiment of a set of ethical, political, and spiritual values that I see as rooted in land sovereignty, black power, and total equity should be studied and employed as a social justice framework that can help us rethink both the historically racist relationship between Columbia and Harlem and the Autobahn Ballroom. And it can also inform all of the respective work we do as scholars and as pr practitioners engaging with real live humans in the built environment. So to get started, Malcolm Little was born in Omaha, Nebraska in 1925 at the height of anti-Black racial terrorism that was particularly insidious across the Midwest and Southern United States. Malcolm's parents, Earl Little and Louise Norton, met in and were active members of arguably the first Pan-African and Black nationalist organization, the United Negro Improvement Association, which was first founded in Jamaica in 1916 by Marcus Garvey and Amy Ashwood. The UNIA came to Harlem in 1960, or excuse me, it was founded in 1914, and in 1916, it came to Harlem, where members joined because they were moved by the organization's commitment to building Black economic and political independence during a time of unimaginable marginalization and racism in this country. Um, Uh, Garvey and the UNIA promoted forms of Afro-diasporic solidarity and pride and believed that people of African descent should establish an independent nation on the African continent. 
Earl and Louise Little embodied the values of the UNIA by practicing economic independence as landowners and farmers, and by teaching their seven children, which included Malcolm, about black pride, intellectual rigor, self-determination, and globalism. So while Malcolm is often thought of as someone who evolved into this internationalist framework, we need to understand him as being born into this framework. Malcolm's mother, Louise, was also a Grenadian immigrant who spoke French, Creole, and English. So I can only imagine the sort of active household that she and Earl ran as Pan-Africanists um, with a deeply global worldview. So we begin to see that Malcolm's ascension into a socio-political sphere of Black radical thought and global politics was very much a natural response to his particular upbringing in a Garveyite household during the height of Jim Crow. Like many Black men and families who were persecuted for embodying dignity and self-respect, Malcolm's father was violently killed for owning land, being self-sufficient, and being a leader in his local UNIA chapter. The death of Earl Little had a profound impact on Malcolm's family, who quickly unraveled in the absence of his presence. As a young teen, Malcolm was sent to live with his elder half-sister, Louise, or excuse me, Ella Little, in Boston where he was introduced to things that most American teenagers are introduced to, like live music and dancing and marijuana. At 19, Malcolm was incarcerated for his involvement in a string of home burglaries. It was during his time in prison that Malcolm was first introduced to the Nation of Islam, a religious sect founded by a self-proclaimed prophet named W.D. Fard. The Nation of Islam was and is similar to the United Negro Improvement Association in that it preaches a form of Black nationalism and self-determination, which many Black Americans who were migrating from the South to the Midwest and Atlantic nor North found uh, it, during the Great Migration, they found particular meaning in. I also want to say that the Great Migration, which deeply shaped the legacy of urban planning, especially in cities like New York, needs to be understood as a form of refugee migration in that Black folks were fleeing racial genocide and terror. And now some of these folks, a part of the Great Migration, were attaching themselves to religious and secular organizations that asserted individual and collective Black humanity and agency in the face of white supremacist evil from which they were fleeing. And here, I think, is an interesting map that um, traces these migratory patterns that happened. While loosely inspired by Orthodox Islam, the Nation of Islam, also known as the NOI or the Nation, holds a particular religious doctrine and creed that is separate and nationally focused in its scope. The Nation is a response to the Black American experience under structural racism. Malcolm, Malcolm quickly rose in the Nation's ranks and became the right hand and heir apparent to Elijah Muhammad, who was the organization's prophetic leader at the time. Malcolm X was instrumental in helping to grow national membership and ascended into the public sphere as an unflinching critic of white supremacy. I think it's also important to remember that Malcolm was still really young at this time. He actually only existed as a public figure for about 20 years um, before being killed at only 39 years old. So it's kind of almost unimaginable for me to think of where Malcolm may have ended up had he lived into old age. And here's a photo of Malcolm speaking at an event with the uh, nation and Elijah Muhammad is sitting in the middle. I say this about Malcolm's age and time spent in the public eye because one of the remarkable things we get to witness about Malcolm X um, and his short but prolific life is that his politics, religious beliefs and cultural awareness evolved in public. After years spent dedicating his life to Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm began to seriously question certain pillars of the nation. I think this really started to happen after his first trip abroad in 1959, where he visited Mecca and traveled across the Middle East to Palestine and Africa and began to articulate the linkage between racism in the United States with Western imperial expansion and global empire. Malcolm X ultimately ended up being forced out of the nation in 1964, and shortly after, he made his way back to Mecca, where he made Hajj and became a practicing Sunni Muslim. Mal Malcolm also spent months in Western and Northern Africa, where he learned from a host of anti-colonial leaders, including Kwame Nkrumah, who was one of many leading the charge to build sovereign African governments in the wake of intercontinental decolonizing efforts. 
While abroad during this time, Malcolm had hoped that an African country would help support his effort to charge the American government with genocide at the United Nations. Malcolm wasn't successful in this way, but he also got to build with many brilliant black American expats living in Ghana at the time, including W.E.B. Du Bois's wife, Shirley Graham Du Bois, and Maya Angelou, two women who were central to Malcolm's later political formation. It was during this time that we see Malcolm evolve his analysis of anti-black racism in the United States into a global human rights cause predicated on an international power analysis. During this five-year period, Malcolm was building with everyone from Japanese organizers, including Yuri Kochiyama, Palestinians living under occupation, Vietnamese anti-war organizers, people across the African continent, and of course, Black Americans living in urban ghettos. Malcolm took what he learned while abroad in Africa, specifically around intercontinental decolonizing movements, and in the summer of 1964, he founded the organization of Afro-American Unity, a multiracial coalition of radical anti-imperialist educators, organizers, culture makers, and everyday people who understood the need to form a Black-led, Black power educational, political, and cultural movement that sought to address the realities of structural racism head on. Malcolm, unlike his counterpart, Martin Luther King, was not a pacifist and believed in self-defense and structural change by any means necessary. But what's most important to this conversation that we're having is that it was Malcolm's profound love for humanity and for Black people shaped by his religious piety and belief in the oneness of God that I believe ultimately informed his commitment to liberation. Malcolm believed that we as humans must exist fully in our humanity. He understood that we live in a world that is literally designed to constrict and deny us of our fundamental humanness, because white supremacy in all of its forms, seen and unseen, is a death-dealing project. Malcolm was rooted in equity, anti-colonialism, sustainable regeneration, global solidarity, the redistribution of wealth, and increasingly in women's leadership. These were some of the values that guided his understanding of power at a global level and also at a personal level. Malcolm gave freely, listened intently, and embodied a monk-like personality that reflected his religious and political beliefs, which I would argue were one. Malcolm X was killed only eight months after founding the OAAU. The organization was a reflection of his growth and evolution post-nation and also of his upbringing as a Garveyite. And while Malcolm is often remembered sim simply as the fiery nation of Islam leader, I'm really interested in unearthing this last year and a half of his life as a Sunni Muslim and global citizen. I also want to mention it's easy for this part of his life to be de-radicalized and misappropriated in popular discourse, but Malcolm never lost his commitment to Black unity and sovereignty. It was actually strengthened during this time. I think rather he expanded his vision of what freedom looks like and understood that by its very essence, an all, it's an all-encompassing project, meaning that no one can truly be free unless we're all free. Um, let's see what the next... Oh. While Malcolm has left this world with so many gems, a political organization, a global power analysis, and religious practice, there was and continues to be a state-sanctioned campaign to rewrite, rewrite his life's contributions as a hate baiter and to silence his legacy, which has manifested in a lack of classes and scholarship on Malcolm and a lack of material resources that, have, that has gone into preserving his outsized legacy. This is not an accident. There has been a decades long political and historical crusade against Malcolm X. And this needs to be understood as an ongoing attempt at social death. So on one hand, there's a general lack of understanding and proper awareness around the real legacy of Malcolm X and his beliefs. And there's equally been a historic lack of funding that has gone into memorializing the Audubon Ballroom and Shabazz Center as a key historic site that's part and parcel of the American story. We can't fully understand or appreciate the general socio-political epoch we're in and the brilliance of Black-led movement work from the Black Panther Party, which emerged after the death of Malcolm and Martin Luther King, to more current organizations, including the Movement for Black Lives and Dream Defenders, without understanding Malcolm X. The same goes for Black popular culture, which is in essence American popular culture. Malcolm influenced the Black arts movement and the creation and employment of hip hop as we know it today. And this is often the space where a lot of younger folks are introduced to Malcolm. 
I believe Malcolm is central to our shared history, present, and future. And by extension, the Shabazz Center as a physical site and activation space that stewards his legacy is also critically important to the landscape of justice work and preservation. I'm really interested in employing Malcolm's political analysis of power to frame and reframe the relationship that Columbia has with Harlem, its residents, its cityscape, and its organizations. I don't want us to think about Malcolm as a stagnant historical figure who sits past, but as someone who's offered a social justice framework that we can use in our respective work and disciplines today. And I think especially here at GSAP, for folks engaging the built environment, urban planning, policy, design, and architecture, it's imperative that you employ a praxis, an action-oriented pedagogical model of learning that centers the most marginal and that centers the history and legacies of the Great Migration, for example, and redlining and COINTELPRO and patterns of human migration that reflect colonialism, imperial expansion, and global warming. As a lifelong resident, I've seen the way Columbia has changed my neighborhood. And this relationship, while not all bad, is still overdetermined by the reality of gentrification, forced displacement, inequity, and inaccessibility. I want to explore how we can take Malcolm's anti-imperial framing of power between communities and institutions and rethink this relationship that Columbia has with Harlem, and by extension, that Columbia has with the Shabazz Center. In the words of Adrienne Marie Brown, a wonderful organizer and culture maker, I am really asking you all to think about how do we get in right relationship with each other and with the land that we're on. I want you all to think about what it means to engage a Malcolm-centered social justice framework in your respective disciplines and practices. I was actually talking to Stephen Burke, who's here a few days ago, and he called this Malcolm-centered frameworks uh, the X factor, which I like. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> so how do you then rethink questions around preservation and planning? Who is centered? Who is being thought of when policy is enacted, when construction is taking place, and when cities are being planned and rezoned, when we center this X factor? This isn't simply a theoretical exercise, but this is something that we need to, that is being demanded of us as we respond to a rapidly changing world that's shaped by ongoing war, health crises, environmental degradation, changing ethnic demographics, and so much more. We're living in a moment marked by late stage racial capitalism. This is what it looks like when our shit hits the fan. <laughs> um, and it's also, this is what it means to activate Malcolm's legacy in real time. I think it's life-giving and affirming to work and exist in spaces committed to our collective wholeness and freedom. It's exciting to employ frameworks that are grounded in a desire to build up and invest in communities in ways that allow for the most marginal among us to thrive. We need to be building communities that reflect our values, and we also need to take stock of the current values we hold. While I understand that there are limits to what the employment of this stuff looks like in a real time, especially at large institutions like Columbia, I think all students, professors, and faculty should be centering this history and this articulation of sovereignty and equity in our work. Maybe if this framework had been, the, un, had been understood and was the space from which we've always operated, then Columbia would have never attempted to tear the Audubon ballroom down, which has always been an important historic, religious, and cultural site. Rather, Columbia would have sought to build up the space because there would have been an understanding and respect for this legacy, the archives, the historical information, and current scholarship and projects emerging from Malcolm X's contributions. The historic decades-long disinvestment in the Autobahn Ballroom and Shabazz Center reflects a general trend of institutions and individuals being afraid of Malcolm's power and legacy, and simultaneously being committed to a type of bureaucracy that holds no space for Black liberation projects because it necessarily undermines the supposed legitimacy of whiteness and the power that is perceived to be inherent in it. So I'm grateful and deeply honored to help reshape this public narrative around Malcolm X's life and his contributions. Part of reclaiming Malcolm's legacy is around deciding how it's best used today. And I believe it's so important that we not only learn about Malcolm, the historical figure, but that we put his values into practice as an everyday framework that guides our decision-making processes and our worldview. 
Malcolm's humanitarianism can be the space from which we reorient this relationship between Colombia and Harlem, and can be the space from which we restructure and rethink the dynamics between community and institutions, and between people, power, and the spaces in which we exist. Questions. I'd like to. I'll, I'll start off. You know, yes. to get us rolling. Yes. Um, I, I love this concept of the X factor and kind of centering um, Malcolm's uh, uh, humanitarianism, but humanity in the the context of this relationship that Colombia has um, with uh, the lands that it occupies and the communities um, associated with those lands. Uh, for you, are there particular acts of restorative justice that you see as um, being on the horizon or that um, this kind of understanding and assessment uh, can lead us toward? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that there are. I think it's hard in practice. The first thing that comes to mind is the real redistribution of wealth um, and like real tangible ways. You know, there's the West Harlem Development Corporation, and there's been kind of this historical attempt by Columbia ever since it uh, really expanded into the Manhattanville, which is not even a thing. No one calls it Manhattanville, it's just West Harlem, um, the Manhattanville Project. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's also like that's actually just a tax incentive for Colombia, and this is not even real money that communities are getting. These are like reimbursements and credit card payments, even if they are large. Um, and so I think that there has to be like a real, I think decision making bodies need to be able to reflect the communities that they're working for in order to really answer these questions properly. And that's the first problem is that folks don't even have access to like the decision making body at Columbia. So how do we really engage in a, a legitimate conversation with actual tangible results if the folks who are thinking living in the community wanting to you know engage in certain ways are not able to move and that's just kind of you know resources and material and that's kind of like i think why i wanted to mention the term bureaucracy um and so it's almost hard to even think about because a lot of what i'm suggesting and talking about isn't even in a like we're not even in that space yet so it's almost hard but i think it's important you know i think that restorative justice looks like, you know, indigenous people leading conversations around the land that we're on and community residents having access to Columbia University for free um, and, and having access to housing and job opportunities and, and organizations like the Shabazz Center and the Audubon Ballroom and so many other institutions not having to worry about, you know, very basic things because we're also an intellectual reserve and that's important to the university and, and to the landscape of scholarship and, you know, for practitioners as well. And so there should never be a sense of scarcity when there actually is none for a place like Columbia. Uh, you talked about the X factor. I'm just curious, for someone whose views change dramatically over a short period of time, do you, uh, or a shortened life, do you think of like the end or like the views that Malcolm X had at the end of his life as kind of what you're applying? Is it kind of looking at like, multiple lenses over the course of a life to examine one thing? How are you kind of thinking about like changing intellectual thoughts onto kind of our, our present moment? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I guess I'm really I'm interested in this last part of Malcolm's life because that's where he ended up. And that's, you know, this was an articulation that he was exploring in real time and probably would have built on, but did it get to like really dive into and I think he wanted you know he was trying to build those spaces and so it feels you know in a way that in order to properly honor his legacy and I'm still learning about Malcolm I'm no Malcolm scholar um, but it feels like part of this responsibility that we have um, at the Shabazz Center and that I have as someone who really honors Malcolm is to shed a lot of light on this particular part of Malcolm's life and to talk about the organization of Afro-American community which a lot of people don't know about um, and kind of have that be the space from which we activate. Um, but it's also, you know, one of the things that his daughter, Ilyasa Shabazz said to me is that I, she was like, I think it's less about 
trying to decipher where Malcolm would have ended up had he lived in 2022. Like, you know, would he be, you know, what, what would he be thinking? I think it's less so about that, but really seeing him as like a, an unending wealth of knowledge that and like understanding that his growth and evolution should mirror our own growth and evolution and that we're also not stagnant. And so what employing this framework means today in 22, 2022, given the particular context we're in, is very different than what it maybe meant in 2001 and what it'll mean 10 years down the line. So kind of being open to growth, I think, is important. Also, I'm not sure if folks online want to engage in the conversation as well, if it's possible, but just one chat open. Oh, so if the chat is open, can anybody online want to either raise their hand and ask them? Not to put them on the spot. In the chat. Yeah, I don't know. Do you want to put, um, ask people if they want to come up onto the screen? Yeah. Oh, that might be a lot. I don't know. People might be. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to, if you want to. They can just write their names in the chat. Yes. Them yes. And, um, Perfect. Them Perfect. Right. Or if they want to write their question out, we'll read it aloud and let you answer. They have the option. I guess I'll ask a follow up question on that. And uh, thank you so much for being here, sharing. This this legacy with us here in the basement of Avery Hall, like what what a kid it is. Thank you. No, it's really great. No, this is not the normal conversation we have here. Like, yeah. This is great. And so um, we want to learn from you. And it's so great to hear you channel this this legacy. And so I have to ask like sort of the selfish question, which is I work on climate change issues. I work on like the hues of imperialism around the world. And um, so you know. What would Malcolm do on climate change? Like, what, what uh, is that? Is that a fair question? I guess you just said like it's not about asking him, like what Malcolm would do today, but like I don't know how do you bring say. this like <laughs> X factor, the Malcolm X framework, anti-imperial framework to what we're dealing with in our neighborhoods with climate change today. I think that's a really important question, and I kind of want to throw it back at you, not in like yeah, any weird way, no. but I'm curious, like if one because. You know, I wrote this myself. I don't know if what I'm saying is resonating or making sense with like people. So if it like resonates in any way, I'm curious as someone who like is really thinking about environmental issues, what would that look like? Yeah, no, it de definitely resonates. And I feel like we need to have more of a conversation about it because, you know, I mean, if we're just looking at Washington Heights and like how people are experiencing the changing environment there, you know, urban heat island effect, air pollution, all these things are the legacy of you know, both systemic racism in the built environment, but also, you know, if we look at the people who live there, they've been subjected to imperial, you know, um, the, the, the engines of empire all over the world, so, uh, and displaced by them. And so I feel like it's, it's extremely relevant. Like, what we're dealing with with climate change is basically the empire that, you know, like, uh, Malcolm saw and started to mobilize against. So I don't know. I feel like it's almost like we were learning too late. You know, I don't know. I feel like we need to learn more. Yeah, I'm, I'm a realist, so I don't even want to go down that hole because it is a little too late. So, you know, yeah. I, I'm like, let's find the join it right now while we're here, but I don't really know what's going to happen down the line. Yeah. I can get kind of dark in that area. But I mean, I, I think you're right. I think this, and then that's part of this conversation is that this is like a really new space for me. Like, how do we use Malcolm as a framework in all of our the respective work that we do. So I don't have the answers, especially around environmental justice. But I mean, I think it starts with, you know, these sorts of classes and, and, and thinking about especially the work that, you know, so many brilliant black women, black queer women are leading in the city around environmental sovereignty um, and, and food equity and thinking about like the ways in which like our environment affects our livelihood, you know, that folks in the South Bronx have some of the highest asthma rates in the country. How, I, I don't know how we fully reverse that, but I know that it, we need to employ like this X factor thing to really think about like what is the root of environmental racism and how do we like really begin to dig at that in a way that's not like scraping but I don't I don't know. I don't really know beyond, you know, I, I think maybe it'll come out in like a conversation or something that you're thinking. But one thing I will say, oh, are you yeah. tapping? <laughs> Not I just want to congratulate you on such a, an inspiring 
conversation. I think you have the basis of your PhD here. I don't know if anyone else agrees, but I'm kind of blown away. Um, I think this question of, uh, of sustainability um, or what would Malcolm do, um, uh, what is the next factor, I think begins with the scholarship around Malcolm X. And so you just mentioned that you yourself are not a scholar. So I'm wondering, I mean, what, on the one hand, what scholars at Columbia are you tapped into to kind of build bridges from your work at the Shabbat Center, your work here at the GSAP, and beyond, right, to yeah. improve the scholarship around Malcolm X so that people can be more in touch with what he would do, quote unquote. Yeah. And then, and then secondarily, um, how do we, I guess, imagine a kind of Malcolm X Institute, as it were, here at Columbia? Mm -hmm. Like if there were a bigger vision of where this is yeah. going, yeah. and there could be an accumulation of your ideas, et cetera, et cetera. We could all get behind it. <laughs> yeah, and no, sir. What is that, you know, to be answering these questions with regard to That's what we're trying to do at the Chicago Center. Yeah. Is it is it is it a kind of lab here in Columbia? Is it, you know, what yeah. is your dream of dreams where this could Sometimes I'm scared to say all my dreams out loud, <laughs> but not in a bad way, but I'm just like, oh, I don't want to jinx it. Um, I, I think the first to, to answer your first question around who I'm tapped into and I think, well, first off, everyone, especially within the context of this class on preservation in Harlem should be tapped into IRAS, the Institute for Research in African American Studies, which I imagine you are. Um, but back in the day, Professor Manning Marable, who was one of the preeminent Malcolm scholars led um, a program on the autobiography of Malcolm X. And there was a lot of wonderful interviews that took place and just kind of scholarly research. And a lot of wonderful Malcolm scholars, including uh, Zahir Ali, um, Oh my God, people are just escaping me right now. But a lot of folks came through Columbia to study Malcolm. And so there's this really interesting legacy coming out of AAADS and um, IRAS of folks thinking about Columbia, folks thinking about the history of Harlem. And so right now, part of my job is really trying to regenerate some of those uh, collaborations and discussions um, in a more reciprocal way that allows for Columbia, or excuse me, for the Shiva Center to have agency over our archives and our history. And so that kind of leads into the second question, which is that if there was something to happen, which there absolutely is, and that's part of this work that we're doing at the Shabazz Center, but that it will be at the Shabazz Center and that Columbia students would go uptown and not be in the basement of Avery Hall, but be in the place that Malcolm organized in and that Dr. Betty Shabazz founded and that Malcolm was also assassinated in. Because we can't talk about this history unless we're there. And I think also, you know, so one of the things that we're doing that's really going to be a thing is we're going to have a Freedom School class up at the Shabbat Center next year. And hopefully this will be just a continuous project that happens between Columbia and the Shabbat Center and the Harlem community. And for folks who are involved in this project, which includes people at Columbia, you know, Manan Ahmed, Susan McGregor, some wonderful students and a lot of other people, we're really thinking about how do we like just use resources that Columbia has, excitement, you know, from students and, and faculty here, and also make sure that this, we have resources to give to community members. So are we like offering stipends? Is there food? Is there child care? Who are the types of people that we're reaching out to? Who are we asking to lead our classes? I imagine, you know, if Malcolm was here, I don't want to like over-determine Malcolm, but he probably would be like, let's learn from the people who've actually lived this. Or if we want to talk about abolition and mass incarceration, we need to talk about, to learn from folks who experienced it themselves, not like me, you know? And so I think it means kind of funneling resources in ways that allow for community to decide what's the best use of them. That's what this equitable redistribution of power looks like. And I think that's what Malcolm would want. And so like, I, I think that we need to be at the Shabbat Center doing this work. And the Shabbat Center is the only place that can do this work really, to some degree, because it's also the place, it's his, and Dr. Betty Shabazz, who's so instrumental, um, and that's its whole other, like its own talk, you know, that's what they wanted. Um, and, and so I think this can, I think students have to like leave this bubble, leave Morningside, leave Manhattanville <laughs> or whatever little area up in, in Washington Heights and like, but you know, I don't want to be like, also I say that and say like, it can kind of get a little bit like, 
Ooh, I'm in the jungle looking at the people living, you know, not in that way, obviously, but, but these things have to happen like in the spaces because it's also such a spiritual space and you feel the energy. I mean, you all were there, like there's a particular energy of that space and it could be so much more like we need to create an archive um, and recreate an archive because a lot of Malcolm's work was lost. Um, and that's part of it. Like we have to like literally do the work of I, let me kind of back up because I think the work that I do happens on a lot of levels and the meta meta level of my work is that we've misunderstood Malcolm and Malcolm has been misappropriated. So it's my responsibility, the Shabbat Center's response, and you know, they've been doing this. So it's not to say that this is just happening now, but part of what a lot of folks have been doing and I'm humbled to now be a part of is really reclaiming Malcolm's legacy and making sure that we understand it in the right way. And so doing something like a freedom school where we get to employ Malcolm Malcolm and think through real live questions of justice, of local government, of, you know, abolition and mass incarceration. Um, you know, it, it, it's, I think that's what the work looks like in, in, in real time. Um, and so that's, you know, part of how I would answer, but I think it could be a lot of different things that we end up doing, but it has to be in community, not, not here. We have a, Question from Zoom from Alade. First, great job. <laughs> um, the built environment is characterized by man made physical features that are often difficult for certain individuals, often poor people, people of color, to, ask, to access certain places. Mm -hmm. As we know, Harlem has a special significance for African Americans because of the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s. With this understanding, how can places and spaces like GSAP combat issues around race, inclusion, and even more so pedagogy to seek um, to seek to address the role of architecture can play in creating more equitable, inclusive communities like Harlem? In short, what can we do after we leave the space? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Sorry, <Okay. Niger. laughs> Um, Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, I, if I can remember, I mean, I, I think it's such an important question, like what can places like Columbia do around equity inclusion? First off, Alade is the goat at GSAP. Like, y'all are lucky. Um, and he's doing a lot of incredible work. <laughs> Um, yes, <laughs> I think like I personally really detest this whole diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism thing um, because like anti-racism and DEI work is a white supremacist project. It feeds white supremacy and it's like this unending loop of like, what do we do? We need to think about things. Help us. It's, you know, and that is a project in and of itself that I don't really care for, it's not my work or something I think that the Shabbat Center is really seeking to address. Maybe others would say otherwise, but for me, that's not what it is. And there's a, like, a separate project that is black liberation and black sovereignty. That's what I'm interested in. And I think that when institutions like Columbia can begin at a very high level, at an administrative level, make the distinction between what DEI and anti-racism work is and what black liberation work is, then we'll have more critical um, conversations that are less intellectually lazy and you know, kind of self-serving and don't really like yield any material change. I also want to say that I think at a very serious level, folks at the top know that there's a difference and are not committed to black liberation projects. So they're not gonna fund or like really be invested in that type of work because it doesn't um, support the continuation of the Ivy League project. So I kind of say that all to say, like that's the conundrum that we're in um, and we just have to be more honest um, about it and kind of like stop playing the silly game. And I think that something Columbia could do, and this is a conversation a lot of, and, you know, I've had with him and with others, is that, you know, like, for example, this fellowship that I'm a part of is an anti-racist um, initiative, which is, like, I guess, sure for white people. You know, for me, I don't really even know how to like understand what that means in my own life because I don't think of myself in relationship to anti-racism. But one of the things that makes me think about is that there's this perception still, I think, and that I feel 
um, in higher ed and in places like Columbia that like, maybe not, I don't mean to say this for everyone, but I think at some deep level that, that they're doing me a favor or, you know, the community fellows a favor by giving us this fellowship when in actuality it's the work of community members it's the work of folks who are leading this sort of like praxis oriented you know movement work um whether it's in the institution or beyond that actually makes a space like columbia more relevant more intellectually rigorous more able uh, to respond to the changing world that we're in like, you know, and, and so I don't know, I just I think that there has to be just honesty in this in that conversation who who is benefiting sure I'm benefiting because I love to talk with, you know, young people and professors and it's really exciting for me to, to write and think and do these projects and move stuff forward, but also like this work pushes Columbia forward. And, you know, Thad and I have talked about this in the past, but like, I think that there's this, ooh, now a lot is getting me started. I'm just gonna say this and I'm gonna stop here. But <laughs> there is a type of white mediocrity that sort of informs administrative thinking uh, around what the redistribution of wealth or resources or how do we re-engage community after these fraught like racist histories what do we do and, and that I think is like not so forward thinking and and when we kind of like not we or when, when institutions I think are honest and, and start to use the term of white mediocrity to describe you know institutional patterns that are racist and that also hold the institution back then we're able to like really honestly have conversations that are far more engaging more relevant more interesting um, more dynamic um, and, and, and everyone wins. Yes, you know, materials are brought back to community. Community is able to benefit, but also the institution benefits. But I think white mediocrity doesn't allow people to see that. So it's like they're stepping on their own feet. No, no, no. no. It's hard to follow up with a question on that. Um, is there anyone on the Zoom waiting for a No one else on the Zoom waiting? Okay, so I want to um, I want to go back to this question of root cause and archive. Uh, and I think that you you spoke really eloquently about how um, you know this the, the archive of Malcolm doesn't really exist in the way that institutions have perceived archives to be, right? And so um, as preservationists and large preservationists in this room, part of what we're, we are constantly struggling with is how to interrogate those histories, particularly when archives, it's not that archives don't exist, but they don't exist by the standards that institutions have established, yeah. right? And so I'm really curious to hear how you confronted that um, and particularly because we're in a school of architecture, in some ways, we um, whether we fabricate this or or we um, kind of believe this, the the built environment and and spatial history becomes our archive. Like it's it's the archive that we encounter through spatial experience, right? And so um, and we're pushing beyond the visual on that whether it's spells, whether it's understanding of, of complex histories um, that uh, don't necessarily have a spatial component because the right to occupy space was suppressed. Yeah. Uh, so how are we confronting this sort of idea of the archive and how quote unquote evidence gets compiled and put together uh, to frame a narrative, to frame uh, not the Yeah. That's such an important question and something I'm thinking a lot about right now. Actually, Columbia is the perfect place to be interrogating that because you all have Sadia Hartman, who is thinking through the question of the archive and Black Atlantic history and the afterlife of slavery. And so all of that, you know, I think uh, it's just I'm so inspired by Professor Hartman there. Um, and it is so relevant for what, you know, I'm trying to think through. We're all trying to think through at the Shabazz Center. So the first thing I would say is this conversation is literally the archive, right? Because we're creating something in some sense that doesn't exist. There are places that have 
archival material like the Schomburg, like Columbia University. But right now the Shabbat doesn't, Center doesn't have any, like a lot of physical artifacts because we don't have like, you know, the humididors and we haven't had, you know, historically the resources to be able to house archives like a museum should. Um, and that's something that we're kind of changing right now, but it's, yeah, that we create something in the wake of its absence. And maybe that'll allow us to then rethink what the, the future of Malcolm's legacy looks like, but it's also then about preserving the physical structure of the Shabazz Center, the Audubon Ballroom, which is its own living archive. It should be a memorial. Well, it is a state designated memorial and you know it should be funded as a proper memorial just as, you know, other spaces are because they are living archives and remnants of history that we hold. Um, and so, you know, I, I want to, and I also think it's about democratizing the knowledge that we then have access to or we create in our archives. So I would love in the future, and, you know, this is something that we're going to do, but everything, you know, create an archive, digitize it, and then be able to have folks use it for free. Like, we don't need JSTOR, we don't need paywalls behind you know, research or resources. Um, we're doing a project uh, around redacted FBI files so they can be publicly, you know, read and used for research and historical understanding. And that will be then a part of the archive. Another thing I want to do is interview like the last living elders that knew Malcolm. These are folks who are really not going to be around for that much longer. And so it's really important that we get their histories. And so, I mean, I don't know. I, I want to speak at a very personal level because I, joined this work fairly recently and so many people have been collecting so much important history and have been thinking about the question of the archive and and preserving a lot of this legacy so everything i say doesn't negate all of what's happening but a lot of it is like what do i do when things don't exist and and i think a lot of it is like we have to recreate the archive and that archive is then like this meta narrative of who malcolm x was and is and why he's important today and then maybe we can decide in this process how we want to best use what he's offered us in real time. Um, and so I think there's gonna be a physical archive at some point, definitely a digital archive, but like Zoom land, the only good thing about it is that, you know, we get to record these conversations and keep them. And so, you know, again, a lot of this is very you know, still in my head, um, but it's absolutely a real question that we're struggling with and, and part of this legacy of dispossession. Um, just to touch upon that, thinking about the building environment, I know that Naja is interested in teaching, uh, <laughs> and I wonder what would a studio that um, would take this on, the question of the archive, the question of the, the ballroom, and the documentation translated into a future project, what do you think that would look like? Well, I think a lot of it is hopefully going to come out in this Freedom School. Um, so definitely for folks who are going to be here next year, please keep your eye out. Um, but I, yeah, so like I see the Freedom School as kind of a multiple, multiple veins and the Freedom, when I say Freedom School, I, you know, this is its own discrete project, but it very much exists within the historical vein of Freedom Schools that were founded during the civil rights to, um, to, to educate and, and offer agency and, and resources to, to folks in the rural South who didn't have you know, access to voting um, and, and, you know, just we're living in, in a moment of extreme racial terror. And so that's the, the legacy, the political and cultural legacy that hopefully this Freedom School will exist in. Um, and I think part of the, 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 the responsibility that we have now in stewarding this legacy and this history is using that space to create um, the archive and to respond with community and so in ways that are that no, don't necessarily serve institutions or like the intellectual excitement that we have but that serve like material change and real life questions that we're dealing with right now in 2022 and so i think our work has to be and that's why i was using that term like praxis and pedagogy that it has to be grounded in the material realities of the built environment that we're in and you know whether it's homelessness in Harlem and in the city, which is, you know, at an all time high and like, what does it mean to employ this X factor when we think around issues of houselessness and, and inequity and just astronomical rent prices in New York City? Um, 
I, that's the sort of stuff I want to be thinking about in a uh, freedom school. And it's also, I think it's, a, it's not like I'm going to come with a, a syllabus that's fully created. Part of the, the, the project is that we have to decide and create together what is important to us and what we're thinking about in real time. And it has to be re like informed by, led by, and, and reflect community. So, you know, this is a class that's not going to be all Columbia students. It's going to be equally amount of, you know, or maybe more residents from the community and Columbia folks um, really coming together and, to, and sharing resources. And I think it also challenges like the perceived like uh, just like this idea of, of not being not having access to Ivy League institutions, not having access to a place like Columbia. I think like the Ivy League project is predicated on a lack of access, which is just not even real. And that's how it perpetuates itself. It's a self perpetuating project. Same thing with Harvard and, you know, so many NYU, all of these places. Um, but to say, hey, we actually do have resources and, and, and information and access to stuff that was created a really long time ago. And let's use that. Let's take hold of that. Um, and so that's, you know, these are all just questions and things that I'm thinking about. But that's exactly, you know, what we're going to be grappling with in our freedom school. And it just has to be community led in order to, like, really do this archive project right. Anyone online? I don't think so. Anyone online? Yeah. Naja, is there a question you want to pitch at students, especially? Sure. I'll do one question. Um, I, I am curious because preservation, like this is a space I'm now thinking about with my the work that I do, but what would, you know, potentially this sort of equitable re- um, framing of relationship between community and institution or between a physical space that you're thinking about look like if you were to employ this Malcolm-centered framework, social justice framework. Do you guys have any ideas? Does it resonate with you? Does it make you think of something else? Hello. Um, my name is Shannon. Um, I would like to answer your question. Um, with an idea of mine. Um, so I'm, I've been researching, you know, the, the life and the environmental injustices people face when it comes to housing and lack of access to indoor air, light, um, ventilation, and air quality. And I think it's interesting that the Tenement Museum, you know, they depict um, these histories, but the, the bigger history of um, in, of the poor living conditions that um, Harlem was subjected to um, is missing from the rest of the dialogue. How do you think that it could help um, or would you be interested in creating an event, a workshop or programming that um, is between Columbia and, and yourself that would illuminate these, the history of environmental injustice throughout time and the activists within the local, local community that really pushed for tenement change and tenement reform. Um, I, I'm sorry if my, I was, um, does that make sense? It does make sense. Thank you for that question. Um, I wouldn't say I'm the right person to do that. That's not a, you know, a history that I'm burst on or have any, you know, like, I, I don't think that would be me, but I think that it would be interesting to, you know, maybe for you or for others to, to possibly lead that class or to, or figure out like who in the community, you know, would be good at, good to, to, to be in conversation with and is already doing that work because I think that's, you know, probably happening at some level and, and really important. Um, but uh, not me. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I was thinking of ways that we could use the Shabazz Center as a space to talk about environmental injustice and maybe even, you know, Columbia's hand in perpetuating um, mm. environmental injustice and the degradation of West, the social fabric of West Harlem. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think just to, to end really quickly, I think that a lot of stuff could happen at the center, the Shabbat Center, and it, it probably will, you know, these conversations, something that's something I've been talking with my mom about who uh, is has been in the field of sustainable agriculture um, and food systems. And, you know, actually, it was really Betty Shabazz who was just brilliant in her thinking and in her articulation of what land sovereignty and by extension, I think um, environmental sustainability means, especially for black folks and what it means to own land. And and so, you know, in some sense, maybe it's a little bit nonlinear to do something like that at the Shabazz Center. But also there is this wonderful history of Dr. Betty Shabazz and, and, and her helping uh, specifically black women own large tracts of farmland and kind of engage with this hor horrible legacy of, of land land loss in the United States, specifically land loss around black farmers and families. Um, but I imagine also that there are other spaces that these conversations could happen in, in Harlem or in, in the South Bronx. I, I think of Tanya Fields and the Alice Fields Community Center. She's someone that's leading brilliant environmental women's rights, you know, the most expansive sense of the word, and then also the ways in which it's connected to issues of food security and land sovereignty. And so someone like Tanya Fields, I think would be brilliant if, you know, but she's, she's busy, but I don't know, you know, or the Alice Fields Center. And I, so I think that, that that's part of the impetus is like, let's, you know, know what community is doing because so many folks are, are, are absolutely at the helm of this work and thinking through a lot of um, what y'all are thinking through and I think want to build in community and, um, it could happen at the Shabbat Center, and then there's also so many wonderful places I think that conversation could happen in. Thank you um, so much. Thank you. Uh, I, when you were talking about the archive earlier and creating the archive, it made me think about that by creating an archive that doesn't exist, yeah. you solve some of the problems around an archive being objective, right? <laughs> like you're, you're bringing subjectivity into it. You don't have to deal with questions of what was excluded from the archive and why was that excluded as you're building it. So in an answer to your question about, I don't have an answer for like what preservation action should take place. But I think the key thing is to bring that like understanding that what you're doing is subjective and that you, that this is not some objective thing that you can go fix, right? You can't be like, oh, here is like a African-American like history that we have not designated that now we need to designate it that installment. And I think our field tends to operate in that way. So I think like, how do you bring the X factors to say like that's, that is not the solution is to go like change the ratio of white versus black landmarks in New York City. That's not that's not how we make progress. So that's kind of how I would answer your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have to sit with what you said more because I agree, you know, I don't think this is about like full like we I'm a realist. Like I don't think that we can change like or completely reverse these very, you know, rooted histories. Um, but I also think at the same time, it is about, you know, accessing or resourcing spaces that historically haven't had resources and creating memorials that, you know, haven't been memorialized or understood as part and parcel of larger histories and stories. And so when we do do that, I think it also like, and, and the question of the archive, and also I think the same goes for like what we uh, designate as a memorial. Um, it completely informs how we think about history. And part of the, the issue with the Shabazz Center as a physical site or the Autobahn Ballroom is that it wasn't regarded as history and it wasn't regarded as central to our understanding of, you know, broader conversations and movements around global solidarity and, and social movement work and black power. And so because the physical space wasn't um, supported, because, you know, real institutional work to, to resource the Shabazz Center or have the Shabazz Center be the site of scholarship and archival work rather than a, maybe a place like Columbia only, you know, then we've completely forgotten that history. And, and so it's like, we're moving from a space of like, like uh, but not reality, you know, because we haven't involved that history as part of this larger story. And so I think that the implications of the archive and also of the memorial is really important and, and like also creating a more objective history that like this stuff is also rooted. You know, we have our subjective experiences, but it's rooted in fact. And we completely leave these like large swaths of history out. We create 
you know, lies. And I'm, oh my God, I'm thinking of like Donald Trump and like lies, facts, news, media. But I think that's part of what even like, you know, in a far more subtle way at a liberal institution like Columbia or in a liberal city like New York, that's exactly what's happened is that we've just rewritten history and said, mm, that, that's not a part of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I extend what Adam was saying. I just underline what you were saying is the fact that the primary tool that we have in preservation, this is something that Eric is on the but the, the primary thing that we rely on is designation, which is creating a list, right? And it's it's either you're on it or you're not, and that mirrors exactly the kind of exclusion that you're talking about with the Ivy League, right? It's either you've made it or you haven't made it, and there it's not really. It doesn't really allow for nuance in terms of giving resources in different ways or um, having different criteria, like we don't have an archive that is specific to the archive, right? And considering different perspectives. So um, I, I think how preservation operates right now is very much built on exclusion. And um, I think it's worth reconsidering. I don't know how, but yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the connection that you drew in terms of having that exclusion um, and reconsidering through the framework of not the best thoughts, I think, is, is a really insightful one. So thank you. Thank you. So in closing, I'd like to share one of my favorite clips of Malcolm speaking only three months before he was killed. This clip is from his Oxford Union debate in England, and it reflects the arc of his evolving uh, political philosophy that at the time was global in scope. And it's also most fitting that the last words of this lecture are from Malcolm. I don't believe in any form of unjustified extremism, but I believe that when a man is exercising extremism, a human being is exercising extremism in defense of liberty for human beings. It's no vice. And when one is moderate in the pursuit of justice for human beings, I say he's a sinner. And I might add in my conclusion, in fact, America is one of the best examples when you read its history about extremism. Old Patrick Henry said, liberty or death, that's extreme. Very I, I read once, passingly, about a man named Shakespeare. I only read about him passing, passingly, but I remember one thing he wrote that kind of moved me. Uh, he put it in the mouth of Hamlet, I think it was, who said, to be or not to be. He was in doubt about something. <laughs> Whether it was nobler in the mind of man, to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, moderation, or to take up arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. And I go for that. If you take up arms, you'll end it. But if you sit around and wait for the one who's, who's in power to make up his mind that he should end it, you'll be waiting a long time. And in my opinion, the young generation of whites, blacks, brown, whatever else there is, you're living at a time of extremism, a time of revolution, a time when there's got to be a change. People in power have misused it, and now there has to be a change, and a better world has to be built, and the only way it's going to be built with it, with it, with it, is with extreme methods. And I, for one, will join in with anyone, don't care what color you are, as long as you want to change this miserable condition that exists on this earth. Thank you.